Thank you, Christy, for that wonderful, inspirational, special music for our international Sabbath, we have an international speaker. And it started with myself for the first couple of years, and we said, well, we're going to have, we're going to invite people. So we had from Haiti, we had from Ukraine, we have from Venezuela. This year, we have a speaker that will speak the word of God to us. And his nationality is Ghanaian. Ghanaian. <laughs> we have uh, we have a big representation in our church from that part of the world, and we're glad to have with us uh, uh, Brother Kofi Tumasi. Right? I I hope I I pronounced it right. Um, and uh, he comes to us from the city of Columbus, Ohio, where he is a um, lay speaker evangelist. And in his market, in his marketplace, he professions uh, the, uh, as a lawyer. And we're glad to have you with us. Um, glad that you came, and we're looking forward to to God to speak through us uh, to you. Yeah, thank you. God is good. Amen. Oh, come on now. We got a lot of people in here. God is good. All the time. Oh, I need it louder than that. God is good. All the time. And all the time. All the time. If you're happy to be here, say amen. amen. Oh, if you're happy to be here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, if you're happy to be here, clap for God. Clap for God. Come on now. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It is a privilege to be here on this precious Sabbath day. I want to thank the leadership, Pastor Marius. I want to thank Elder Roxon and the family. And I want to thank those that also put together this beautiful program. The assemblage of talent has been incredible. And I can only be grateful that I get to deliver the word and be an expositor for the word on this Sabbath day. Uh, I'm a bit biased. Uh, I am from Ghana, so I love all the cultures here, but come on now. There's something about Ghana. Where are my Ghana people at? Where are my Ghana? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, all right. Well, nonetheless, I'm happy to worship in the midst of the different cultures that are assembled here on this Sabbath day. For today, my message is titled, Beyond Symbols. Beyond Symbols. Symbols. I, I believe the message or the declamation that I'm going to furnish to you all on this Sabbath day is going to help us look beyond the symbols of our culture, the symbols that nestle within our heritage, the symbols that are part of our mores, and how we can look beyond that and truly unify the time that we're in. So for today's message, I really want you to pay close attention, and I really want you to absorb and imbibe the message. I want us to look closely on this day of cultural grandeur, on this day of cultural commemoration, what it means to look beyond the symbols of a culture. But before I begin the message today, as Pastor rightfully introduced, and Pastor, you almost had my last name right. You almost, 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 almost did, almost did, almost did. All right, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. But uh, on, on this day, I want to share something with you all, because I believe it's befitting on this international day. So, as Pastor rightfully said, right, I, I, I go between the two worlds of being a lawyer and also a lay evangelist. So I want to share just a minute or two before I, I go into my message about a ministry that I am a part of. And this ministry is called, and I just want to share about one or two minutes, maybe some of you might be interested, a, a ministry called Mission Driven Purpose. Matter of fact, we started this organization 11 years ago. And 11 years ago, 
young. I was going into Walla Walla University, Adventist institution. I said to myself, how can I engage in cross-cultural missions? How can I engage in proliferating the word beyond my domestic territory? So a group of friends of I, we came up with an organization called Mission Driven Purpose. And consistently, because we believe in sublime excellence, consistently for 11 years, we have been engaging in cross-cultural missions. Now, I want to just share a little bit with you about what we do. So we believe in the, in the paradigm of Jesus, of healing, teaching, and preaching. Those three facets. And with those three facets, with our organization that we started 11 years ago and we've been consistently engaging in, over those years, one of the main facets that we wanted to engage in was leadership. We believe that transform leaders transform society. Right? It's not enough to just be a manager, but you must transform into a leader. So over those 11 years, we want to ensure that we train persons to become leaders. So where has our organization taken us? It's taken us to, of course, uh, where I come from, Ghana, but it's also taken us to Kenya. It, do I have some Kenyans in the house? Any Kenyans in the house? No Kenyans in the house? It's also taken us to Malawi. Any Malawians in the house? Any Malawians? Any Malawians? It's taken us to a couple of different places. And of course, domestically here, we've also done some work in Texas as well. But one of the things that we've done is that we've been able to train leaders, about 634 in the past 11 years. Not only that, when we go into these communities, we have been able to construct water wells. Amen. So over the years, we have been able to construct seven water wells for the different communities that we have been ministering in. Not only that, over those years as well, uh-oh, my clicker. If you could hit the next one for me, please. But over these years, we've also been able to construct or sponsor three church buildings. We want to ensure that there are areas in this world where they don't have an edifice like the one here. We want to ensure that they have places to worship. Not only that, over those years as well, we have also been able to distribute Bibles about 836. We want to ensure that persons who are newly conversed into the Word are equipped with the sword. Not only that, we've also been able to engage in food distribution over the years, and those are the amount of people that we've been able to serve. Then we've also been able to do giveaways, whether it's school supplies, whether it's uh, food items, all kinds of items we've been able to give away. As you can see, there's someone there is receiving a chicken during the Christmas time in Ghana. So we have been able to utilize our efforts to heal the world. If you keep going for me, please. And then, of course, one of the prime areas that we have been able to engage in is conducting 27 evangelistic campaigns over a span of 11 years. And over those 11 years, we've been able to baptize 3,786. Amen. And this was actually a recent missional odyssey that we did in Ghana. We actually partnered up with our flagship Adventist channel, Hope TV, Hope TV branch in Ghana. And we were able to do this for the entire country of Ghana. And we've been doing this in other places, Malawi and Kenya, and we've been doing this consistently every year. So as I close off with this, I encourage those who want to engage in cross-cultural missions. If you want to go outside of Ohio or where I'm from, New York City, or if you want to, you know, go out to Ghana, you want to come out to Kenya, Tanzania, every single year we organize a missional relief trip. So if you ever want to experience for about one week a cross-cultural experience, then I have you or I beseech you to look to our organization, Mission Driven Purpose. And you can connect with us. I'm also going to be here after the message as well if you also want to get some information as well. And you can always look us up if there's something that you're interested in. If you want to go outside and do something daring, something bold, then you can join us for our annual relief trip. So I just wanted to share 
that with you all on this day of cultural celebration. Amen. Beyond symbols. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we're about to engage in the Word, I pray that, Lord, may you give us the discerning spirit and enable us to understand what it means to look beyond the symbols of our culture and truly be proactive for your mission. We pray this in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Beyond symbols. The thesis for my message on this day of cultural celebration is fairly simple is that beyond the symbols, beyond the cultural mores, beyond the cultural heritages, we must look beyond our cultural uniqueness and practice tangible deeds that unify and transcend the social culture of our times. Say that one more time. Beyond the symbols of a culture, beyond the cultural mores, beyond the cultural heritages, our cultural singularity must yield in us an ethos of tangible deeds that transforms and transcends the social culture of our times. Beyond symbols, must be seated in our minds and our hearts that while we may cherish and relish these symbols, we must look beyond these symbols and say to ourselves, how are we going to unify this world with our cultural uniqueness? Beyond the monuments that we cherish within our cultures, we need a seed within our minds and our hearts, looking beyond those monuments and saying to ourselves, how can we utilize our uniqueness not to divide this world, but to unify this world beyond the festivities of your culture, my culture, beyond the festivities, beyond the music. We must penetrate we must introspectively discern how we can exercise substantive deeds to transform and transcend this cultural milieu that we nestle ourselves in. The text that I'm going to utilize as a foundation to help us discern what it means to look beyond the symbols of a culture, we're going to look in the book of Galatians. And I want to be a faithful expositor and exegete this text properly. I'm going to go through Galatians because in the text that we're about to go through, there's a lot of parallelism as to the do's and don'ts with our cultural uniqueness because Beyond this costume, beyond my name, beyond the facets of a culture, how do we truly exercise and engage in substantive deeds? So in Galatians 2 verse 11, the text introduces a dilemma. In Galatians chapter 2, in this pericope, we are introduced to the gospel globetrotter and world-renowned evangelist, Paul. And in this text, we find that Paul has come to the city of Antioch. And I want us to discern carefully, because when Paul came to this city of Antioch, Antioch, I'm biased, I'm from Ghana, but also from New York City as well, so I'll liken it to New York City. Antioch was a major city, a city with a booming culture, a city with a vibrant culture, radiant. Antioch was radiant, and Christianity was permeating throughout Antioch. But 
the dilemma was, though Christianity was permeating within this region of the Roman Empire, there is a dilemma. Because we have the Christians, the Jewish sect of Christians, and we have the Gentiles. So we have a division within this great city. And let me tell you about this great city, because I'm about to draw a parallelism and apply it to our modern culture. Because what we see here is that in this city, these Jewish Christians wanted to monopolize the Christian faith. They believed that because Jesus, the disciples, and Christianity emerged from their culture, they wanted to hoard it and monopolize Christianity. All right? They believed because their culture is superior, that Christianity emerged from their culture, they wanted to exercise and practice cultural dominance. They wanted to have cultural hierarchy. They wanted to be culturally dominant. They wanted to be culturally superior. Let me draw it to our modern times. On this day of International Day, I want us to discern this because some of us in here have utilized our cultures and have made our cultures superior than everyone else's culture. Some of us want to make sure our culture dominates within the edifice of the church. Some of us want to make sure that it is our culture and the other cultures are lower and inferior than us. The same element that they were practicing in Antioch is what Paul came to meet. And this is the application that I want to draw on this day of, on this international day. That if we're going to look beyond the mere cultural symbols of our times, cultural uniqueness must not yield separation. Cultural uniqueness must yield integration. Yeah, because some of us utilize our culture and create separation within the church. We create that within our social culture. But if we're going to look beyond the outfits that we have on today, we're going to look beyond the flags that we have raised up here. We must discern to ourselves that our cultural uniqueness must not yield separation. It's yield integration. Now, if we're going to unify This world, this can't be a divided church. Can't be a divided church. We want to win and unify, transcend our social culture. We need to integrate. Go back for me real quick, please. Let me illustrate this. Integration and what do we mean when we win, when we integrate. So, after my first year of undergrad, my brother's a pastor, so, and he was at Oakwood and I'm at Walla Walla, right? So, we're on opposite sides. So, you know, pastors are clever, pastors are clever. So, the holidays was coming around and I was eager to get back to Queens, New York City. I was eager to get back home, see the family. You know, it had been a long semester. So my brother was heading out on a mission trip. He was going out to Kenya to do a mission trip. And I was not going with him. You know, I wished him all the best because I truly wanted to get back home and get some R&R, get some rest and relaxation. So when I got when I was about to take the flight and go back to New York City and see my family, I got a call from my brother. Said, Kofi, 
That's how pastors always get you. Pastors are clever, clever, clever. He said, Kofi, the Holy Spirit. You know, when they start with that. <laughs> watch out now, watch out. I said, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. That the Holy Spirit, uh, who am I to fight against the Holy Spirit? Uh, who, who am I to fight against the Holy Spirit? This is the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is telling me that you need to come with me to Kenya. I said, no, you lying, man. Come on. Come on. The Holy Spirit didn't tell you that. The Holy Spirit didn't tell you that. He said, no, 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 no. Then, you know, they get the serious, solemn tone and the voice, Lord. He said, no. The Holy Spirit is telling me that you got to come with me. So I'm thinking about it. I'm like, man, New York, going out to do, you know, God's work is good, but man, I really want some rest. He says, no, nah, man, this is something you need to do, and I want you to also do an evangelistic campaign. Now, I never done an evangelistic campaign. I was like, are you sure? He said, no, the Holy Spirit is telling me. I said, all right. So... <clears throat> We ended up traveling to Kenya together. Now, when we got to Kenya, this is where I started to see that uh, I think he set me up. As <laughs> soon as we arrived, he was doing an evangelistic series, and I was doing an evangelistic series, experience and experience. So he said, no, man, you know, just take your time. You know, he was being encouraging and he was motivating. You know, just, you know, you got this. The Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, man. Keep that in mind. Keep that in your purview. So as I was doing this campaign, I was preaching hard, and Saturday was coming up, and it was time for baptism. It's not about the numbers, but I want to illustrate something here. It's not about the numbers. We know that. It's, not, it's never about the numbers, but I want to illustrate something here. Uh, this was my human weakness. So... After preaching the word that week, Saturday, I made the appeal, and only three people decided to, to be baptized on that day. It's a bit discouraging, but I said, all right, uh, it is what it is. You know, my brother said, this is something that the Holy Spirit wanted me to do. So we go out to the river where they're doing the baptism, I have my three baptismal candidates, and then I see my brother, he's bringing like the whole community, right? He's, <laughs> <laughs> he, the chiefs, everybody, he, he got everybody. I see, you know, human weakness, right? Human weakness. And I told you, why did you bring me out here? So, again, Said the Holy Spirit, you know, we, it was two weeks. So he said, look, this, this week is going to be the week. So faithfully, exposed in the word every single day. Came down to Saturday, final day, only one person decided to become baptized. Human weakness, not about the numbers, but human weakness. I want you to follow me. Go down to the pool. Again, this man has the whole kingdom behind him. And I'm saying to myself, no, nah, the Holy Spirit did not tell, tell you that I should come along. <laughs> so at that moment, I told my brother Kojo, I said, Kojo, I'm, 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 no, I'm not doing this again. I'm not going to have you utilize the Holy Spirit and manipulate me into coming back again. <laughs> so we get back, get back home, and life goes on. Life goes on. I said, Kojo, I'm never doing this again. So, a year later, <laughs> again, break is coming up. I get another phone call. Said, Kofi, again, the Holy Spirit is <laughs> telling me that you need to come along. I said, Kojo, that's not the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know who's talking to you, but that's not the Holy Spirit. talking about integrating, integrating. I want you to understand something here because I didn't have too much faith in myself and I'm not saying it's about the numbers, but I mustered the courage to yield to my brother's request. And when we went out to Kenya again on that faithful year, God blessed us 
and we baptized about 200 that year. And I want you to understand something here. Is that because I did not separate from God, but integrated into him, had a communion with him, a relationship with him, a belief in him, integrated with his words. That time, God blessed us on that trip. Used my feeble mind, but blessed us on that trip. And I want us to understand something here, my people of Middletown, that on this day of cultural celebration, what we must remember, that if we're going to win, we cannot win by separation. We need to win by using our cultural uniqueness to integrate with one another. Amen. Beyond symbols. I don't got a lot of time, so let me make sure I keep moving forward here. I want us to really discern what it means to look beyond the symbols, the monuments, the clothing, the flags, and really engage in unifying the world with our cultural uniqueness. So I want to move on here because we see that the Jewish Christians wanted to create a degree of separation. They believed they were all-knowing, all-superior, and culturally dominant. So now, there's another group. You see there, I've underlined it, the Gentiles. All right? Not a group per se, but, you know, those who are non-Jewish, broadly speaking. So, what we see here in this specific time period is that the Jews, Jewish Christians, some of them were slowly being won over. That we don't have to be culturally dominant. We should be accepting of other cultures into Christianity. But this is what happened here. Though some of them were starting to accept persons who are non-Jewish, this is the Dilemma. They believed that these Gentiles had to assimilate into the Jewish culture in order to receive the kingdom of God. Because the text illustrates, and as I'm going to show, is that they believe if the Gentiles did not submit themselves to the customs of the Jewish culture, they weren't fit for the kingdom of God. So now, they move from cultural dominance to cultural assimilation. But what's the problem with cultural assimilation? This is the problem because we're looking beyond symbols. It's because we need to discern that in Christianity or with God's love, Though God, and I'm not saying and I'm not elocuting that God accepts every aspect of all cultures, all the features of every culture, God still honors our uniqueness, but wants our uniqueness still to be distinct but unified together. And this is it here. And this is the application I want to make. Because... We need to move from multiculturalism to interculturalism. Let me break it down. Multiculturalism posits that in this church, there are different cultures. And we are worshiping and unifying ourselves together. But then, the next step that we need to take is interculturalism. Interculturalism is where different cultures within a setting are collaborating, communicating, and working with one another. You see, what I have seen in a myriad of places that you can have a multicultural church with a monolithic worship style. What I've seen is multicultural practices and still a monocultural experience. We need to make a paradigm shift on this Sabbath day. We need to make a paradigm shift that in order for us to move beyond symbols, 
cultural uniqueness is not about making one culture the standard. Cultural uniqueness is about leveling the playing field for all cultures. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay, it's not enough to say we're multicultural, but it's still one dominant form of leadership in the church. It's not enough to say we're multicultural, but there's only one dominant worship style in the church. Beyond mere cultural symbols, our cultural uniqueness must not make one culture the standard that everyone needs to catch up to. See, in the social, in the marketplace, these is what sometimes our social cultural practices. But if the church is going to be the paragons, the standards, what is practiced within the marketplace must not be practiced within the church. It's not about hefting one culture and saying, you all need to catch up, you all are inferior. It's about making all of them and leveling the playing field. We need to move from multiculturalism to interculturalism, working together, changing together, making sure it's not just tokenistic leadership, making sure we are valuing all cultures. But let me move to the third aspect. I don't have a lot of time. Let me move to the third aspect here. Because we see in Galatians chapter 2, We see that the Jews had created first a degree of separation and wanted to be culturally dominant. Then we see some that were slowly being converted over and finally gaining the understanding that we can be accepting of other cultures because other cultures are also fit for the kingdom. So what we see here, there's a lot of words there, but it simply says what happened here in Antioch is that you had persons finally understanding what the kingdom is about. That it's not about one culture acquiescing to all the customs of another culture. But this is highly important. It might be small, but it's important. Because though it seems like this church in Antioch is slowly accepting cultures outside of the Jewish faith, we see that Peter, uh, presumably seeing as the de facto leader, Peter was engaging with the Gentiles, ethnic Jew, but engaging with the Gentiles. So he was crossing that barrier. But then we see here in the text that though Peter had no problem crossing the barriers and being accepting of the Gentiles, those who are non-Jewish, when leadership came with James, those who are some of the strong leaders of the Jewish contingency in Jerusalem, as soon as they come into this setting in Antioch, Peter starts to exhibit hypocritical behavior. Right? He didn't mind worshiping with the Gentiles. He didn't mind eating with the Gentiles. He didn't mind seeing them as his brothers and sisters. But when this dominant leadership came. Peter started to switch up. This is what I want to extract from the text. Next slide for me, please. Because beyond mere cultural symbols, cultural uniqueness is not about being indifferent to the trials of another culture. It is about standing in solidarity with the trials of another culture. You see, Peter had no problem showing the love and affection in public when 
the circumstances were limiting. But when persons who would be much more judgmental of him would see him fellowshipping and enjoying koinonia with those who are not Jews, instead of Peter taking the costly stand, Peter didn't do so. I want to draw the parallelism to today's modern culture that some of us here, we give lip service that we support other cultures. But when other cultures are in times of need, when other cultures are going through trials, when other cultures are going through struggles, we distance ourselves from them. What the outside world is practicing, we are bringing those practices here. When our brother and our sister from another culture needs us, we are nowhere to be found. Right? We come here worshiping, hearing about the love of God, but when they need us going through those trials. For some of us, we're only worried about our own reputation. Some of us, we don't want to lose our lofty positions. Daddy is costly. But this is the hope I have because I believe standing is part of the Christian experience. See, I'll make this real quick here. There's something about a cat that I like. I'm not really an animal lover. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to those animal lovers. But there's something unique about a cat. And I was reading about this. They said that with a cat has a unique ability. That if you're on the seventh floor of a building, I'm not saying you should go and try this, but if you're on in a skyscraper or on some lofty height, there's this unique aspect. The cat has a unique reflex that no matter how you throw a cat, follow me, follow me here because we're talking about what it means to stand with another trial. No matter how you throw a cat, whether it is on its side, whether it's upside down, no matter how you throw a cat, once you throw the cat, whether it's on its side, whether it's from this high or this low, wherever you throw this cat, the unique thing about the cat is that no matter how you throw it, the cat is still going to land on its feet. I want us to understand something here. If we're going to go through trials, I want us to understand here, we might be scared, we might be nervous, but God will help us stand on our feet. It's costly. I'm over time, I'm over time, I'm over time. Let me just hit this one point. Let me just hit this one point and we close it up. I want to finish this off. Just give me five minutes here. Because this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it with the text. Because beyond cultural symbols, Peter practices contradictory behavior. Drawing a parallelism with today's culture. We give lip service, oh, we, we got you, but when in time and need, we're not there to support them. Beyond cultural symbols, not about the garb, but it's also engaging in action. I want to show you the kind of action as I close out here, what happens. Is that Peter is being contradictory. And Paul reprimands Peter. Says that. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Next slide for me, please. Because they were so caught up on their customs and seeing their culture as superior. But this is it as I close out here. Because beyond mere cultural symbols, cultural uniqueness should implore an engagement in substantive deeds, not superficial deeds. It's time to be substantive with our actions, not superficial. See, Paul showed courageous. He, he reprimanded Peter. He said, Peter, this is unacceptable. And this is it here. Because what Paul was trying to illustrate is that Paul created what we call a paradigm shift, changed their theology at that moment. That whether you're a Jew or not, the kingdom is for you. Amen. Whether you're Ghanaian or Nigerian, the kingdom is for you. Whether you're from Cambodia, Japan, the kingdom is for you. Whether you're from Liberia or you're from Poland, the kingdom is for you. 
I want us to understand something here. That if we're truly going to go beyond mere symbols, we need to make a cultural shift within our culture. The world out there is divided, but we need to make a cultural shift and show unity within the walls of the church. Amen. It's this time. And how are we going to do it? This is number one. Number one, we need to have what I call self-consciousness. We need to be aware of our own personal identity if we want to ensure that our cultural uniqueness is not dividing but unifying. Number two, we need to have what I call other consciousness. Start learning about cultures outside of your own culture. Then number three, what you need to have is what I call interconsciousness. Is start working and collaborating with other cultures. And then the fourth element that we need to have is a unifying consciousness. Coming from a unifying posture. How do we unify, unify, unify? It's time. Beyond mere symbols, it is time for us to not just showboat about our cultural uniqueness. It's not time to flaunt our cultural uniqueness. But we must utilize our cultural uniqueness to engage in substantive deeds. I'm waiting for a day where the scripture says, as you all have it right here, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female for all of you are one in Christ. I'm waiting for that moment in time where all of us, as, as John saw on Patmos, that when he looked up into the sky, he saw a, a multitude that he could not count. He saw kindreds that he could not count. Children that he could not count. Cultures that he could not count. I want us to understand here today, if we are going to truly live according to Christ's will, if we're truly going to show a world that is divided, that we're unified, we need to look beyond our mere cultural symbols. Utilize our cultural uniqueness. Practice substantial deeds. And transcend the world that we live in. May the Lord bless you all. Yes, there is.